call this Wednesday, July 21st, 2021, Civil Service Commission to order. The uh, open session and chair rotation looks like it's the number one item on the agenda. So we do the roll call. Commissioner Poplowski? Here. Commissioner Ebium? Oh, she was there. I understand. She was there. She must be having. <laughs> well, we need her, don't we? <laughs> Oh, there, there she, she comes. There, there she comes. Um, yeah, we have we have a quorum. We have a quorum, but we still need her. <laughs> we still need uh -huh. Sherry. Yes, we need Sherry. Good morning. My oh my internet is uh, I don't know. It's having temper temper tantrum. <laughs> <laughs> We're continuing with the roll call. Commissioner Ebium here. Commissioner Feth Michelle. Here. Commissioner Hardin. Here. So our next item, um, Commissioner Chair Rotation. So you would, as the vice chair, re revert to chair, and Commissioner Ebium is slated to become the vice chair. So with that, um, you want say that? Say that again. Who's? Oh, Terry's going to be. Got it. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Terry will be chair, and Commissioner Ebbian would be vice chair. Yep. So I guess Commissioner Popolowski, you can pass the vice chair gavel to yourself. As okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, Terry. Thank you. you passed your probationary period. You did. You did with <laughs> with all these with all these uh, feminine <laughs> assists. <laughs> yeah, I've been the chair a few times. So. so then we can move to item number two: the approval of the minutes. I'll move for the approval of the minutes as provided. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes. Roll call. Commissioner Poposki? Aye. Commissioner Ebium? Aye. Commissioner Feth Michelle? Aye. Commissioner Hardin? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, with that, we go to item number three on the agenda, public expression, an opportunity for the public to address the commission. Uh, and uh, so do we have anybody for that today? It doesn't appear that we do. And we also had no email or voice message public expressions that were submitted by 8 a.m. this morning. Okay. So that allows us to move to item number four, which is the employee organization. I see Patrick here. Do you want to say something now? Sure. Um, thank you, Terry. Um, uh, and good morning, commissioners. Um, my name is Patrick Hickey. I'm the field representative with STIU Local 1021. Um, just two items uh, from us. Um, the first is uh, we just want to express our support for the um, modification to the code enforcement series. Um, just had one question on that, which is whether the county has dropped the idea of a code enforcement officer three position. I know that was being discussed at one point. Um, we understand that right now there'd be a one, a two, and a supervising officer. Um, so that that's just a question that we have. Um, I may or may not be able to stay for that part of the agenda. Um, and then the second uh, issue that I wanted to raise was just a concern that we've had, um, sort of a growing concern that we've had in a contradiction um, in, in um, some of the county policies regarding the use of acting positions. 
So under the civil service rules, um, you know, there's sort of three ways that an employee can be brought into the county. Um, they can come through the normal certification process. Um, they can be brought in um, as a provisional employee. Um, generally, if there's sort of a, a lack of, um, of eligible candidates um, for a position, or they can be brought in as a temporary employee, usually because of some emergency or um, a, an incumbent being out sick. Um, the, the Board of Supervisors created a, a policy, policy 41, that allows for staff to work out of class and created this acting category. And our concern is that um, it, I believe that the intent of that initially was really to fill in for these short term issues and, and challenges of, of, of keeping the, the county fully staffed, of covering for employees out on maternity leave or sick leave or something along those lines. Um, or in some instances, very short-term projects that only needed somebody for a, a you know a brief and, and defined period. But what has happened is we're seeing um, employees who are put in acting positions for um, years, uh, you know, more than a year, or in some cases, many years. Um, and it it basically blocks other individuals um, from being able to apply, being able to throw their hat in the ring to try to get a position with the county. And it really does undermine the whole purpose um, and spirit of the civil service rules, um, really to make it open uh, to everyone, uh, free of discrimination, free of any form of um, you know, sort of uh, nepotism or um, favoritism. Um, You'll hear an example a little bit later on the agenda um, of, of one of those, but what I would encourage uh, the commission to do is to reach out to the board um, to take a look at this, um, to see if there is a way to try to address this issue. We as, a, as an employee organization will be doing the same. Um, you know, we obviously want the county to function effectively, but we also want all employees and, and all community members to have a, a fair shot at, um, at getting employment uh, with the county. Um, and not have positions sort of uh, doled out to individuals without any kind of process or review or, um, you know, fair hearing. So, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. We are not uh, dealing with any closed session issues today. And that allows us to move down to the class studies we have for today. Item 66A, human resource clerical positions. All right, I think that's my cue. Can you hear me okay? So who's doing this? Uh, I am, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there we go, Thank sorry. <laughs> so good morning, Chair and Commissioners, Heather Crapo, human resources analyst. Uh, you have before you a memo reporting our findings from the recent classification study of human resources office support positions. Um, at the beginning of the study, incumbents Shelly Tubbs and Maddie Sample completed position description questionnaires, more commonly known as PDQs, uh, detailing the duties and responsibilities assigned to each of them. Um, after careful review and analysis of the PDQs and comparison against the current classification specifications, uh, human resources determined that both incumbents regularly perform the job duties detailed in their allocated classifications and that no classification modifications or reclassifications are warranted at this time. Uh, therefore, we have no recommendations regarding this item and no action is required by the commission. Um, I am available for any questions or clarification needed. Well, that certainly looks easy. We don't have to do anything. <laughs> Uh, well, is are the incumbents here? It says following a review, the commission shall hold a hearing in which the department head who's here and the incumbent each position shall be given an opportunity to be heard. So um, I can tell you one of our incumbents has since retired. Shelly Tubbs um, has retired. Um, Maddie Sample is our current staff assistant three and I don't see her on this chat here. Okay, good. Then I, yeah. I have no comments. Okay, that allows us to move on to item 6B. Good morning, uh, Johnny Cranmer, Human Resources. 
Um, I'm a little bit thrown off because I just discovered a typo in my memo, so I'll try to get <laughs> over myself. <laughs> so uh, you have before you a, a classification study of the code enforcement officer series. Um, this is reportedly written in 2000 uh, during the Slavin study. Uh, the code enforcement officer one is your journey level uh, code enforcement officer. And the code enforcement officer two is a supervisorial classification that's only identified by one line in the class spec that says it's a supervisor. So um, what we're recommending is the adoption of a new two class series in which code enforcement officer one is the entry level trainee classification. This classification will allow the county to recruit and train incumbents who do not have journey level experience. And the new code enforcement officer two is the journey level classification in which fully trained incumbents perform the full range of duties with greater independence than the entry level. This classification will allow the county to train and promote from within as well as recruit from the outside for journey level applicants. With regard to the um, the incumbents, there are currently five code enforcement officer one incumbents, two uh, which have been employed by the county for less than one year and are serving a one year probationary period. It is recommended that the three non probationary incumbents be reclassified to the new proposed journey level code enforcement officer two and recommended that the two probationary incumbents remain as code enforcement officer one until such time as they have completed their probationary period and can be considered for a promotion to the two. So then the next thing we want to that we're, we're recommending is that we've taken the code enforcement officer two and rewritten it into a true supervisor class. And that proposed uh, classification is before you as a supervising code enforcement officer. And it, it just more fully describes the supervisory role and the duties and then it is recommended that the current code enforcement officer two, who is serving as a supervisor, be reclassified to the new supervising code enforcement officer. And finally, um, as part of the reorg of the um, the code enforcement unit was previously a part of the building division of the Department of Planning and Building. And lately and more recently, it has been functioning as a separate unit. And so the goal here is to make it an officially a separate unit of code enforcement. And to that end, the code enforcement manager classification that's before you has been developed. And that person would oversee the code enforcement division. So our recommendations are um, that you adopt the two new classifications or the modified revised Code Enforcement Officer 1 and 2, as presented or as modified by the Commission, adopt the new proposed classification of Supervising Code Enforcement Officer and the Code Enforcement Manager classification, as presented or as modified by the Commission. And here's where my typo is. I have the approved the classification of four incumbents, but it's actually right. three. Right. And right. then the one um, Code Enforcement Officer 2 would um, be reclassified to supervising. And I've written uh, your recommendation motion up there at the top, which you can um, decide uh, as a the commission how you want to adopt them. I am available for questions, and I believe that some of the uh, incumbent code enforcement officer people may be here and may also wish to speak. Hey, so you're saying this went, these original go back to the Slavin study. Mm -hmm. you know, since then we did with almost everything set up this situation where one was the trainee and whatnot. So this one escaped. Well, we so, do have several that still are not, but oh, you um, do? <laughs> this, we do still, but this seemed like a perfect opportunity if the county um, has the opportunity to to hire people that that um, don't have the these specific code enforcement in their background to train them and promote them when they've um, when they've fi finished their year of training seem like a good opportunity to to do this. Okay, I think I would like to see us 
uh, deal with these in the uh, recommendation motions to three different motions. Uh, so as far as the first one goes, do uh, we have a motion to adopt? Gary, I have a question. Okay. Um, so the code enforcement two says it, um, that the certified code enforcement officer is highly desirable. And that is also um, noted in the supervising description as well as the manager. And, and I don't really understand what that is, but if it's something, if it's an important certification that we would want a journey level person to have, why wouldn't it be required for our manager or our supervisor? Um, it, it should not be required in any of them. Um, it's not, it's, uh, we spoke to the department and it's not a requirement. It's uh, that they, and they don't, and they don't need it to be a requirement. It's, it's something that um, is desired but none of the, um, they, they all say highly desirable. And if they, they don't- do, I agree. I, and that's my question. My question is, I don't, I don't understand who does the certification and why or how it's important to the job performance. But my question is, does it make sense that if it's highly desirable for a journey level person, why wouldn't you want your manager or supervisor to to be certified if it's the, if it's an important certification to call out and say it's desirable that's that's my question um well my guess is that nobody from the department is here to speak to that but they uh, specifically indicated that they do not require the certification and if mr burks can speak to that that's awesome i certainly wouldn't mind if i may um uh, usually I would say through the chair, but I'm, I've not done this process before, so please be patient with me. I don't know the etiquette. Uh, so we feel like you're in a peace officer situation. There's a state program, the post certification that would be required. In our case, there's only um, sort of a private organization called KCO, the California Association of Code Enforcement Officers, but it's not a state regulated program. Therefore, for a number of reasons, we did typically we don't require it only because it's private and that there's many uh, other opportunities, whether it's through ICC International Code Council. They also provide certifications for code enforcement. So to keep it broad, um, th that's typically why that's not a require for any other code enforcement organization either. So it wouldn't be unique in this case. It would be pretty much standard for all jurisdictions. It's just sort of a, a preferred circumstance, but not required because it's not regulated. And I hope that was helpful and I can answer any questions. I hope that's not inappropriate, but I'll certainly try if, I, if I'm able. Well, thank you very much. So I, I have a question. Okay. Um, so this proposal adds essentially another position to this division, that being a manager. And um, I guess I'm wondering, you know, when I read the job summary for the code enforcement manager, um, I'm wondering why the need for a supervisor still exists. I, I get the breakdown from code enforcement one into entry trainee and journey into those two groups. Um, and then the no, into entry trainee, and that some of them went into the journey, which is code enforcement two. Um, and the current code enforcement two uh, would become the supervisor. So I guess I'm wondering why we need a supervisor and a manager, both of those positions. Um, 
I, you know, when I read the job summary for the manager, um, you know, it's that person's a liaison between this separate division now and the assistant director of planning and, and business. And I understand the importance of that, especially if it's a new, essentially a new department or new division. But I don't understand, with, with not that many employees in this division or even the current breakdown, I guess I don't understand the need for both a supervisor and a manager. I would think, yes, a manager as a liaison but couldn't the manager also oversee the employees as well? Um, okay, Mr. Burks, you wanna address that? Uh, sure, so as it stands right now, it, it certainly makes sense what you're describing, but the Board of Supervisors approved our unit to grow from about six positions to 17 positions. So there's going to be a lot of field operations to oversee. So what they approved in their plan was to have a, a division manager and actually two supervisors, one to oversee traditional code enforcement and one to oversee cannabis enforcement, which I'm sure as you all know is um, a major undertaking currently. So they, that that's why they're laying that foundation so that we can basically hire for the foreseeable future. Well, thank you, that explains a lot. So, so would the cannabis enforcement supervisor or, or some of the other positions, would they be dealing with the, um, what's the word, the uh, addressing the current cannabis cultivation ordinance? Is that what they would, is that what this is? I, I know that the county has a huge backlog of um, unlicensed of applications that haven't been processed for cannabis cultivation. Is that increasing from six to 17 positions? Is that going to address that huge backlog? So in our recent enhanced cannabis um, enforcement proposal that went in front of the board, there's actually two things that are happening simultaneously. So within the actual cannabis program, they have created a, or will look are looking to create an additional five or six positions that are going to be um, enforcement of in-program sites. So in code enforcement, we will be dealing with only uh, illegal cultivation or non-permitted cultivation sites. And so that, that'll be our role, but they also will need you know, to have some supporting staff to try to get a handle on this based on our plan. So who would deal with legal sites that haven't complied to the ordinance? Exactly. So that would be the cannabis programs enforcement structure. So when we came to the board, the sheriff's office through their uh, County of Mendocino marijuana eradication team, code enforcement and the cannabis program, we all got together formulated a plan and we all have our individual roles. So the cannabis program will handle all the in-program enforcement and they'll have their own staff to do so. And then as far as code enforcement goes, all we'll be looking at is being the central hub for complaints and directed enforcement. And the cannabis program will take the in-program, the sheriff will take the sort of dangerous situation ones where, you know, non-sworn folks shouldn't be going and code enforcement will handle the rest through you know, through this effort, whether it be through noticing or administrative citations or. So, you know, so is it, a, is it a, what in the, in the organization of things, where is cannabis enforcement in this? Not for illegal sites, but for legal sites, where are they housed? That will all be through the Mendocino cannabis program. They'll have their own enforcement personnel for all the sites that are in application. And is the Mendocino Cannabis Program connected to building and planning? They are, but not in the not in this proposal that we're making today in terms of their own enforcement. Everything that you see before you would basically be to address complaints uh, through the traditional you know uh, system and all the whether it be reactive or proactive illegal cannabis. Uh, okay. Okay. Great. Which well, we figure there is about 5,000, so we got our work cut out for us, but this will be a big step in the right direction. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, absolutely, anytime. 
Okay, are we uh, ready for a motion? Yeah, I'll move to adopt the revised classifications of Code Enforcement Officer 1 and 2. We have I'll, a second. I'll second with the idea that I wanted to thank staff for uh, changing the format uh, on the cover memo. I like the idea of the recommendations being at the top. Good job. Anyway. Thank you. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the revised classification of Code Enforcement Officer 1 and 2. Roll call. Commissioner Poplowski. Aye. Commissioner Ebbian. Aye. Commissioner Feth Michelle. Aye. Commissioner Hardin. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, so we can move on to the point number two, adopt the new proposed classification of supervising code enforcement officer and code enforcement manager. Do we have I'll a move. motion? I'll move. Okay, it's been moved that we adopt. Second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the new proposed classification of supervising code enforcement officer and code enforcement manager. Roll call. Commissioner Poplowski. Aye. Commissioner Ebbian. Aye. Commissioner Feth Michelle. Aye. Commissioner Hardin. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, so moving right along to point number three, approve the reclassification of incumbents as follows. Now, is this supposed to be four here? Is this where the typo is or this is three? Yeah. It's supposed to be three. Okay, this is three. Co three, code enforcement officer one to code enforcement officer two. And one code enforcement officer two to supervising code enforcement officer. We have a motion. So move. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and second to approve the reclassification of incumbent as follows, three code enforcement officer, one to code and officer two, and one code enforcement officer two to supervisor code enforcement officer. Roll call. Commissioner Poplowski. Aye. Commissioner Ebbian. Aye. Commissioner Feth Michelle. Aye. Commissioner Hardin. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Thank so you. That takes us to other business where we have the communication from Donna Schuler. Uh, has everybody read that? Mm -hmm. She was here, yeah. right? He's here. Okay. So I guess if everyone approves, we can let her speak. Well, should we hear some background first? Uh, Johnny, can you just get, I mean, we've read it, but can right. we just. Uh, uh, sure. For the, for the public, yes, I will be. Yes. Back. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, on this item attached, you have a communication uh, from Ms. Donna Schuler, the public health employee. She has requested that this letter be provided to the commission along with the, a request that she be able to address the commission during the next meeting. And also attached with this item is a letter uh, dated June 4th from HR Director William Schertz, rejecting Ms. Schuler's appeal when it was initially received on June 2nd on the grounds that there is no appeal process related to uh, Ms. Schuler's request for appeal and responding to some of her statements and questions. And yes, Ms. Schuler is present as well as um, someone from the department if you happen to have questions. Okay. So is it everybody okay with letting Donna Schuler unmute herself and speak? Does she know how to do that? 
Oh, yes, I'm here. Um, thank you, Chair Poplowski. This is my first time attending a Civil Service Commission meeting, so I hope that you'll give me some guidance in how to address the commission and commissioners. Um, thank you for this opportunity today to speak before the commission. I'm here as a public health civil service employee of Mendocino County. I've been employed by the county since August 2018. I was hired as a senior department analyst to complete our public health department's accreditation and quality improvement projects, which I have been performing at a high level of skill and have received really very good performance evaluations. I've had numerous supervisors since I was um, appointed to this position because we have had, um, unfortunately, the loss of our public health director in May 2019. So I have had six supervisors myself during that period of time and have also served during the pandemic and done a lot of other things. I was asked to accept the acting assignment for program administrator in 2019, December 2019, by my supervisor at that time who was preparing to accept the human resources director position and we needed to have more staff supervised. So I was glad to take on that role and give some continuity to our department underneath that duress that we were feeling without a health department director. So I, con I have continued to perform the accreditation and quality improvement work during that time and also took on roles in the DOC for contact tracing chief. So I performed at a high level for the county to protect our population. I have asked each one of my supervisors if I would have the opportunity to not be in the acting assignment. I didn't ask to be in the acting assignment. I just wanted to continue with my work with accreditation and quality improvement. I finally had that opportunity to um, interview for that position in December 2019, but they really were not hiring for accreditation. They were hiring for the COVID response unit and I have been devoted to this project, so I did not want to leave it. Even though the interview went well, I, I declined um, accepting that position for working specifically in the COVID unit, which I had been working in 100% of the time and then 50% of the time since October. Um, I was doing data um, cleanup for our contact tracing team at that time. Once again, I've had several supervisors and many of them are not familiar with public health work. So it's been a little bit you know, chaotic, I would say. And I think this acting classification has been challenging, not just for me, but for other staff in our department. We just lost some more staff, two more staff this week, right at a time when public health should be rebuilding and we're getting a lot of money coming into public health. So it's really unfortunate when you have skilled staff that are departing because they've been repeatedly put in acting assignments because we can't fill the assignments because people leave from administrative leaves or whatever the reason is, and then they don't get the opportunity to become you know, permanent in their position. And so they have left. We just lost really two key employees in the past week, which is hurting our health department. And we, we do have stability now because we have, um, we have had an interim um, public health director that was Mary Alice who's present and we have a transitional director now. So that is adding stability, but this overuse and some would consider abuse of the acting assignment is harming our public health department. And that's why I'm here to speak today, not just because of what happened to me recently, I interviewed for continuing in the role that I'm doing um, with pub public health accreditation but in the program administrator position, because I have been performing well in that acting capacity for uh, 19 months now. And unfortunately, something happened along the way, not, I would say, at the HR um, end of certifying me to be able to be interviewed, but more in the, maybe in the department and where they didn't recognize that we were really in a critical moment of our accreditation process and you cannot just bring somebody new in because maybe their resume looked better, whatever it was, something happened in the screening and interview process where I was eliminated. 
So that was unfortunate because it really does not serve the commission. It does not serve the county and the employees to bring in somebody new who will have to go through uh, at least a year's worth of onboarding and training to become familiar with where we are in the process right now for accreditation. There are only 58 accreditation coordinators, if there are that many right now in the state of California. So it's a really highly specialized position and task. And I don't think it was understood when the program administrator position was interviewed that they would really have to jump into a, a place where we actually have a deadline of March 2022 to complete our submission of our documents. So that's why I'm here today to um, address the, like Patrick had explained earlier, the frequent use and extended use of acting class of acting assignments for positions. And I'm wondering why we aren't using provision no more. So that would be my question to the commission um, that I would hope to get a, some kind of resolution or response, how we continue and maybe look at the numbers, how many people have been in acting classifications or acting assignments and for how long and what's, can we shave that down a little bit? Can we use that less? I understand the need to use it, but I think it's an abuse. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I admit that I am not really sure exactly how to proceed, but I think uh, William Schertz might be able to shed some light on it. He did send Donna the letter how Procedurally, through the process, everything seemed to be on the QT, but uh, this whole issue of temporary positions needs to be monitored, it seems like, at least, and uh, done away with, if possible, whenever possible. So, uh, Mr. Schertz, do you want to say anything? Or Sure, absolutely. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Um, so, uh, HR, since I've been the director, it's only been like a year and a half um, uh, since we've been, I've been doing this. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I, we have noticed that, that there has been, um, I would say, some overuse of acting uh, and out of class positions. Um, and uh, we're actually, uh, I'm actually looking at um, at, at the actual the, the policy 41 and, and um, I'm looking to eventually make some recommendations for or re revising that policy to ensure that that uh, it is a, a more of a temporary uh, situation where uh, certain requirements would be uh, needed in order to uh, uh, assign someone into an acting or an out of class. Um, assignment. Um, it has become a problem, uh, as as uh, Ms. Schuler has, has uh, stated, that there are a number of uh, employees that have been in acting positions for quite some time. Now, HR uh, is uh, the way that that policy um, is, is that um, the department is supposed to um, uh, send justification to HR uh, for us to determine the, uh, whether or not that their uh, department need um, uh, is justified to extend acting classifications. And uh, we do have, um, uh, with as you may know, uh, I changed the, uh, the HR structure uh, at the beginning, at the end of last year, in the beginning of this year and uh so that we are more able to uh, uh monitor th that process um in, in a i think it's in a, it's in a better way and and that we do have uh staff that actually uh verifies with departments about their their acting and out of class status for for employees and so uh what we're looking to do if any if somebody's been put in an acting uh, capacity and assignment that uh, we would like to have a request a requisition for uh, opening that that position for recruitment. So so there are some things that we we need to put in place. Uh, you know uh, there are things that are not written down, 
And I think that uh, I think the uh, policy needs to be um, uh, more specific in, in some of these areas so that we have better adherence to that policy. That policy is, is um, it leaves some things open for interpretation and, and uh, subjectivity. Uh, we'd like to get um, uh, more honed in on the uh, uh, being more objective uh, and based uh, uh, putting people in um, uh, those temporary assignments uh, should be uh, uh, a little bit more, uh, I, I would say, regulated uh, by HR and, and through that policy. Uh, so that's one thing that we're looking to do. Um, uh, the other thing is that, um, you know, the, the provisional appointment. Uh, so we, I, I don't know, Johnny may have some uh, ideas about how often we, we've had some uh, provisional appointments. I haven't seen any, have I? Since I've been here, I don't think that we've processed any of those. We have had a few, um, and generally the provisional appointment uh, is in the absence of a list. It is for um, not to exceed six months. It's a provisional appointment is basically a call to recruit. So at a time a provisional appointment is made, uh, we begin the recruitment process. A provisional appointment is something that the, the director of the department may uh, request. It is not a shall. Um, and the reasons generally when we see provisional appointments, it's because uh, the department uh, does not have anyone. Uh, there is no list and the department has no one that could fill that role and provisional appointments generally come from the outside that the the acting assignment policy 41 allows the department to put someone in an acting assignment for a variety of reasons if they have a vacancy but they know that and they know that they're going to fill it and they would do recruitment that's one of them Another reason they might do it is because they have someone who's out for an extended period of time and they don't know how long they're going to be back, how long they're going to be out, and they need somebody to, to fill that role. Another reason they might do acting assignment is if they're in the middle of a restructuring and they they need someone to do a role, but they're not sure what the what the the structure would look like after restructuring. So there's a variety of reasons why you would put someone in an out-of-class assignment. And Policy 41 allows departments to, to put people either uh, temporarily in an acting assignment or an out-of-class assignment and allows the county or the department to compensate them for that. Um, and the Policy 41 does allow for it to go on no more than a year without further review by human resources. And that's probably where as William says, it gets a little vague because after the first review, it doesn't say how long it can or cannot go on. It just says it should not go on for more than a year um, without further review from human resources. Um, provisional appointments, we've probably had one or two a year uh, for the last few years. And, you know, a couple of years ago, um, we formalized an administrative direction that uh, that was that was given years ago, but we had no documentation of it. And that is that the HR director can approve the provisional appointments and we report them to you. So um, you'll see them down at the bottom of the agenda in the HR director's report. When we have a provisional appointment to report out, um, then we list it there. And when the provisional appointment ends, we also list it there. So to show you that the provisional appointment um, and so those do only last six months and then they make a regular appointment either with the person that they gave the provisional appointment to or you know from from another person there's a variety of reasons why the provisional person may or may not be selected you know to fill the position permanently can i ask okay, a I, I feel having listened to patrick talk about how the provisional appointments and that do somewhat thwart the intent of the Civil Service Commission to make it possible for an equality of people 
filling these positions that's they're they're in them without going through the normal process and in this situation that we're talking about today it seemed like as long as it went according to the rules that we really had no grounds to do anything the whoever the composed the hiring group they made their decision for whatever reason but that's not to be questioned if it's done correctly and they're not uh, you know mm -hmm. they're not giving us grounds for an appeal so uh and i think we've heard a number of people talk to it now so i'm not sure whether miss schuler's efforts here are going to get any help from us but i think she should be thanked for once again shining the light on it i guess that uh, we do need to uh, as people have said monitor it and and improve it eliminate it whenever possible so uh, anybody else want to say anything to jenny yeah. Terry, um, so I would just request that um, William, you said that you guys that your department was looking at the use of um, of um, temporary or uh, provisional, and there was another. There's another. There was another term you used out of um, class. Out of class appointments and acting. And, I would request that you um, give us a timeline and report back to us on the changes that you've made um, to address um, not only the concerns you've pointed out, but um, if there are um, more nuanced concerns that are being expressed by our um, labor um, groups. Um, so I don't know what your timeline is for um, completion of your review, but I would like you don't have to you don't have to give me a timeline today but i would like to get a report from you all on what your timeline is and then a report out on um what your what your um conclusions are and what your process how you've changed your process and and i agree with you terry this really isn't an issue for us to there isn't really any thing more we can do other than just monitor the situation and request information Jerry? Um, I see two things here. One is the discussion about provisional acting assignments, um, that, that issue. But also see the issue of, based on the letter that I read from Ms. Schuler. And, and just from, I mean, I read, I've read this through about three times now, and I still have some questions I'm not clear what was Ms. Schuler's acting assignment that what was the position that she was given an active uh, act, acting assignment for and then what was the position that she was and I'm not sure if it was a screening or an interview at this point there's some confusion about that so I I, I have a bunch of questions so I guess I want to start with that but what Shuri, what are we going to do if we get the answers to those questions? What is our, where's our responsibility? What it, are we it, do? It's just for me as a, if I'm going to spend my time reading this, I want to understand what I read. And I think for, for the public um, to know, also to have that information, it's not going to, it's not about what, what's going to change necessarily. But I think for the purposes of having a, um, an, a complete picture i think that's it's important certainly it's important for me i i would concur with you sherry because being on the commission our education largely comes on the job right and uh so when an item comes before us that is involving things that are new we don't understand taking an opportunity to become more enlightened i think is worth doing all right. So, so uh, Ms. Schuler was uh, put in an acting position for program administrator, which order? was over uh, the accreditation uh, program for public health. Regarding the other side of uh, your your question, I, I think the department's going to have to. Uh, Mary Alice Willerford uh, should be able to address the 
the department's process and in, 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 uh, uh, in their uh, interview process and, and uh, decision making for the appointment. Uh, because the, the civil service rules are very are very broad in that is that we don't we we don't provide uh, specific uh, how tos for departments to uh, do that. It's just a matter of they have to uh, have a conversation with all of the candidates that are provided, and uh, that they are given a, a broad uh, 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 ability to. Uh, determine their their internal process in order to uh, to make those uh, decisions and appointments for those uh, positions. So okay, was the, uh, Ms. Wilford, do you want to speak to that? I, I'm, I can, um, good morning commission. And my name is Marielle Sullivan. I'm currently the assistant director for HSSA. And I can definitely um, let you know what the agency's um, process is for interviews, if, if that would be helpful. Okay. Um, um, and so, I mean, the agency are, we have an agency staff support unit and they um, receive the list of the qualified candidates from the human resources department. And from there, um, they contact all the, every candidate on the list to see if they're interested in, in um, interviewing and then also to schedule the, um, the interview. So HR does the screening and then sends us that list and then our staff support unit sets up the interviews. And then um, we have, you know, um, various questions for depending on the classifications that we ask every candidate, we ask them the same questions for the, and, and give them the same amount of time to respond to those questions. And then the questions, um, all the, the questions are rated, the responses are rated from the, um, the, app, the candidates for each question um, on a scale of like one to 10. And then the department's um, practice is to take the top two candidates and do background checks on those two candidates and then make their decision on um, on, refer on the reference checks in the background on um, which candidate they want to hire. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sherry, do you have further? Yeah, so, so the was the process involving Ms. Schuler was that a screening or an interview? Um, first, the, um, and, and if I'm saying this wrong to the HR department because I'm, I'm not part of them, but they do the initial screening to make sure that the list that they give us that everybody meets the qualifications. So once we get the list, we are setting up interviews. So there's so, there's prior to coming to us. And so then, was it a, was it an interview then? It was an interview, yes. And and what was it? What was the position being interviewed for? A program administrator. Uh, uh, that Ms. Schuler had been in the acting position since December of 2019. She was. She was put into that, I believe, around the end of December of um, 2019. And, and then, I heard and I heard Johnny say that the acting assignment shouldn't be it, this is written that it shouldn't be more than one year and i can speak a little bit on that so during that time i think um because of the pandemic in february and i and i may not have the exact dates um but in you know, excuse me in march i believe donna was pulled out of um and reassigned to the emergency response for our COVID pandemic and so she um worked in our emergency, our EOC center, and then um, and then back, um, I think she mentioned some of it to do with our contact tracing too. So a lot of that time she was not working in the accreditation program. She was focusing on the pandemic um, as as many of the people in, the, um, in, in our agency were doing. Mm -hmm. And then um, she did, I know probably back in, I, I believe October, November, she started, she was still doing um, some of her time for the um, the pandemic and then picking up some of the duties again in accreditation. So we extended that acting position in December again. So, okay. Um, and so from that interview, after all the interviews are conducted, what I heard you say is that the top two are then chosen from that. Correct. And, um, and in the interview process, 
what Mr. Schertz says in his letter is that the department determines their selection process, determines their selection process. So I'm assuming what kinds of questions to ask and so forth. And um, Ms. Schuler states in her letter that the people on this selection process committee um, weren't supervisors and were out of department. So how are the pe how were the people chosen to be on this committee when they don't have that? It sounds like they don't have the background to evaluate to evaluate. They actually, um, so and, and again, it depends on the classification um, of you know what we're interviewing for, and 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 in this case, our we had um, people on our staff support unit who were fully aware of what the qualifications are for the program administrator. They did the interview, and and they also have the responses that are being looked for for the questions, and so that's how they're able to rate. So they're aware of the qualifications, but. But they don't have, okay, they well, don't have direct experience the though. The yeah. that we're looking for for the questions, yeah. Okay. You know, the, the questions that are asked, they they are aware of the responses that we are looking for that we need, that we want for the job, so. Okay. And then um, and then from there, I, um, I took every one of the applications and reviewed those myself to make sure that I agreed with what our staff support um, on the interviews that I agreed with the responses that um, that they had picked, you know, rated people accordingly. And all the interviewees were given the same set of questions, yes? Yes. They, they, we do not um, deviate from the questions. We, we they, they ask the questions and that's it. They cannot um, deviate at all from any of the questions. So. Uh, okay. Uh, uh. This is kind of treading on, treading here. I'm just curious to know, would someone, I mean, when I read her, her letter and, and talked about her ex, not only actual experience acting, acting um, director or program administrator, um, and I was just, anyway, it was extensive and I'm, I know the county has a hard job recruiting people to positions. I, I've heard that many times sitting in these meetings. And um, can you speak to, I, I don't know if this is outside the purview of what we're doing, but can you speak to how many people were interviewed for this position or I feel like we are, I feel like we're going down a path that's inappropriate. This is a decision, a department decision that was made. HR reviewed it and followed the rules. So you are trying to understand why they made their decision. And you're asking, I mean, the HR's letter specifically says that the department does not need to give a justification for their hiring decisions. So I'm hearing, Sherry, you ask the department for justification. No, I, I haven't asked. I haven't asked that. No, I haven't directly said what's the justification. No, I didn't ask that. Okay, I'm just well, trying to get a, a better question, picture. Then. I'm just trying to get a better picture of the process. And my last question is really not about getting a picture of the process. It was more out of curiosity. Uh -huh. So I can retract that question. Okay. Um, but I was just curious to know. She just seemed on. Yeah, I'll, right. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I think, thank you. Uh, I think we have, well, I think we have to thank Ms. Schuler for giving us the opportunity to become a little more educated to this whole issue. And uh, I think we're ready to move on to number eight, Human Resources Director Report. Uh, so, um, I do want to point out that uh, Ms. Schuler has her hand up. I think she wanted to make a statement. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't catch that. 
Thank you, Chair Poplowski and fellow commissioners. Um, this was a good opportunity for me to just express my um, concern as somebody who has written the workforce development plan for our public health department and really sees an issue with our um, hiring, recruitment, training and retention and succession planning for our department. I wrote the workforce development plan. So I'm using this as instructive for me to see what we need to do for our process improvement. And I have addressed the transitional director. Yesterday, we spoke about this, the need for us to be able to recruit. We have a lot of vacancies in public health right now, and we want well-qualified, experienced staff to stay. And so whatever happened with this process, as um, Commissioner Sherry, I don't see your last name, it says E. Willits, um, um, ha has brought up, there's, there's something with the process that doesn't work out well, sometimes, especially if the interviewers are only looking at the program administrator qual um, questions and not really understanding what the person will actually be doing. I know when I did interview for the senior department analyst position, the first interview, before the second interview, I finally found out what it was I was going to be doing. Somebody sent me a link with the accreditation work that I would be doing and I came prepared to the second interview so that I could speak to it and address it. But often when you're coming from the outside and applying for one of these positions with this generic requirements of what you're going to be doing, you don't even understand you're going to be overseeing a tobacco program or a home visiting nurse program or an accreditation. You don't know because it's very generic. So the interviewees uh, are, are, are unaware and so are the, the persons, you know, both from both sides. It's a little ambiguous and it's not necessarily helpful for getting the the really the, the best candidate into the position. So thank you once again for bringing up and, and it's probably went on longer than anybody expected. And um, I'm just really looking forward to um, help helping to resolve this and make this go better for others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schertz. All right, for the director's report. Um, so not a whole lot uh, for an update. Uh, I think last last time I, we updated uh, a little bit on uh, some of the things that had been going on. Uh, we continue to uh, <laughs> uh, work on priorities given to us by the board of supervisors on some of these reorganizations, which means that uh, we have to do some classification work. To, as an example, the uh, code enforcement uh, classifications that you just saw today. Uh, so we continue to work on uh, some of those uh, uh, more recent directives, as well as uh, from a classification standpoint, those things that are in the queue. Um, so uh, we have a, a, a lot of work that we're working on. Our recruitment, uh, that has not waned at all. As a matter of fact, it's probably gotten more busy. Um, and. Um, uh, I, I just haven't seen it uh, really change much, uh, even through the pandemic. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's a constant. And so uh, we are uh, uh, working as hard as we possibly can in HR, to try to make these things happen for the departments and get some of those uh, positions filled. Uh, it is a little bit, um, for whatever reason, uh, 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 for some of these classifications that we're recruiting for, a uh, hard time uh, uh, finding some uh, good applicants. Um, so um, hopefully that'll change in the in the near future. Um, uh, so uh, you know it's 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 not uncommon for us to uh, have to go out again on the same recruitment uh, to see if we can't find some uh, good qualified applicants that can uh, uh, that want to work for the county. Um, and um, so, uh, so we continue to 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 do the the good work that we do in HR and uh, to uh, uh, support the rest of the county in 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 what we do. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay, thank you. That takes us down to the adjournment portion of this meeting and. Uh, it is 10.06. We stand adjourned. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank yep. you. Thank you, everyone.
Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you Bye. next one. <laughs>